Hey, yeah. Uh, I think I've met most of you guys. Hey, am I talking loud enough? That's good? Cool. All right. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Philip Monk. I'm the CTO of Tlon. And uh, I want to tell the story of Urbit's development, um, you know, up until now. Uh, Urbit's been around for a really long time. Uh, it's, you know, longer than any of us have been around it. Uh, but I've been around it for about nine years now. Uh, and I've been working on it full time for most of that time. Uh, and so I, I think I have a, like, a long and unique history with the project and I, you know, so I think it's suitable for me to, uh, to tell the story of, of how we got here and kind of the heritage that we all share. Um, so I'm gonna try to go year by year and tell as much of it as I can in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, obviously it's been a wild ride and there's only so much of it that I, you know, that I'm privy to. There's all kinds of threads coming and going, but um, I'll do what I can. So, um, in 2002, uh, I am obsessed with baseball and the Diamondbacks, and that's all I do basically, is play baseball and play backyard baseball on the computer. But Curtis is, um, so Curtis Yarvin is, uh, he worked during the dot-com bubble on WAP phones, uh, which was internet phones from back then, and he, he made some money, quit, and decided he wanted to build what ended up becoming Urbit. Um, this, is, this is a long time ago um, from, you know, from a lot of perspectives. Uh, for him, it's before, it's before anything else you might know him from, basically. Um, and so you know, I, it wasn't his only focus for all that time, of course. But uh, he did start working all the way back then. And, uh, and yeah, so. Most of the code from this time, we don't have any, um, any record of. It's just prototypes on his machine. But the goal was basically to build software well, because he'd seen how it gets built in the, you know, in the real world and was not satisfied with it. So for the next eight years, um, we don't know a lot, because Curtis worked on it in secrecy, basically. But by the time he gets to 2008, he completes what we now recognize as NOC. Um, there's been a few changes since then, but very few, nothing fundamental. In 2010, he, uh, he, f he finishes a prototype of REC, which became what, which became who, so a language that compiles down to NOC. Um, and at this point, he, he posts it publicly. Uh, so this is the first time anyone else knows about Urbit, as far as I'm aware. And he... Um, he suggests that anyone who is interested in this should try and write uh, the decrement function in NOC. Because if you're familiar with NOC, it only has an increment. And so he's like, okay, if you really want to understand this, write this almost trivial thing in it. Um, but you're not actually going to be able to write it unless you understand NOC. Uh, and when he did this, uh, there, he only got a couple of, of uh, people who successfully did it. And he, he told people that there would be a prize. Where, no, he said there may or may not be a, a, a prize, which may or may not be valuable. It turned out to be galaxies, which have since accrued some value. Um, as far as I'm aware, these are the first galaxies to be distributed. Um, and some of the, the, the people who got galaxies back then are still around, still own their galaxies, and are part of the community. Um, one thing this this makes clear is that the outline of Urbit ID existed even back in 2010, back before uh, almost all of this crypto stuff. I don't know exactly when it, when it dates to, but at least back to 2010. So at this point, um, typical user is still Curtis. Um, now a, a, a few of his readers on his blog uh, are aware of it, but um, it's still just him working on it. And, the technical accomplishments by this point are you know, somewhat more impressive, Knock and, and Rec, which became Hoon. Um, but what's, what I want to focus on mostly for, for 2010 is, is the pitch. So he wrote a blog post at this point, which I still think of as probably the most important like, foundational architectural document about Urbit, where he introduces Jets, the 
uh, the Ames network, Urbit's relationship to existing software. Uh, but he also has a concise framing of like the mindset and how he architected Urbit. Um, and so I'm actually going to read out a couple excerpts because some of it's really uh, well written and I'm, I'm not going to be able to do better than that. Um, so the, uh, he, he opens the blog post with the paragraph, you know, Urbit is a static functional namespace, a programming environment specified as a single stateless frozen function. The Urbit function is Maxwellian, formally defined by a small system of axioms. Urbit, while a cool toy, is designed for practical computing. So you can think about this paragraph for a long time, and probably should. Um, every like, phrase there is, like, eliminates whole sections of what Urbit could have been. Um, so it's a, it's a single stateless function, which is a very particular programming model, which is quite uncommon, and was even more uncommon back then. Um, the function is frozen, which implies a strong constraint on what kind of function it is, because it's got to be suitable for anything you're doing if you're going to use this forever. Right? It's a forever computer. The function is Maxwellian, um, which means that the answer must be small and simple and, and universal. Um, and, it, and it's designed for practical computing. So Urbit is not a scientific project. It's not an academic project. It's an engineering project. It has to be suitable for what we actually do with computers. Um, Grab some water. So he then talks about, he, he introduces a metaphor that's probably the like, Urbit's most enduring metaphor, which is um, talking about it as Martian software. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to read out a couple paragraphs, or three or four paragraphs, because uh, it's really hard to understand Urbit without understanding this section. So he says, few of us have been to Mars, but science fiction has filled in many of the gaps. We know that the Martian civilization is immensely old. Its software technology, therefore, must be similarly antique. Obviously, nothing like it exists on Earth, though those of us who remember VMS might be deceived. Whether we remember VMS or not, some of us are unhappy with the state of Earth software. Therefore, it behooves us to consider an alternative. Since we have not yet established communications with the Martians, who retreated into tunnels as the planet froze, we cannot just FTP their code. We could, however, try to write it. What is Martian code actually like? There are two possibilities. One, since Earth is 50 years old and Martian code is 50 million years old, Martian code has been evolving into a big ball of mud for a million times longer than Earth software and two million times longer than Windows. This hypothesis strikes me as possible but implausible. Since the big ball of mud expands indefinitely, Martian code would therefore be so large and horrible that, despite its underground installed base, the server room bulged into space like a termite mound, intercepting low-flying asteroids and stinking up the solar system all the way to Pluto. Our latest space telescopes would surely have detected this abominable structure, if not, in fact, collided with it. Two, the second option. Therefore, at some point in Martian history, some abject fisk of a Martian code monkey must have said, fisk this entire fisking ball of mud. For lo, its defects cannot be summarized, for they exceed the global supply of bullet points. For numerous as the fishes in the sea, like the fishes in the sea, they fisk, making more little fisking fishes. For lo, it is fisked, and a big ball of mud. And there is only one thing to do with it. Obliterate the trunk, fire the developers, and hire a whole new fisking army of Martian code monkeys to rewrite the entire fisking thing. This is such an obvious and essential response to the big ball of mud pattern that, despite that we know nothing about Mars, we can deduce that it must have happened on Mars, probably several times, probably several hundred. For each of these attempts but the last, of course, the result was either abject failure, another big ball of mud, or both. But the last, by definition, succeeded. This is the crucial inference we can draw about Mars. Since the Martians had 50 million years to try, in the end, they must have succeeded. The result, Martian code, as we know it today, not enormous and horrible, tiny and diamond perfect. Moreover, because it is tiny and diamond perfect, it is perfectly stable and never changes or decays. 
It is neither a big ball of mud, nor tends to become one. It has achieved its final, permanent, and excellent state. So when we talk about Martian software, that's what we're talking about. We're saying, actually, everything here is tending toward a big ball of mud. And we're going to set all of that aside and write something that, that isn't that and hopefully doesn't tend to become a big ball of mud. So that's the pitch in 2010. Um, and in a sense, that's, that's still the pitch now. Uh, for a lot of people, that's, that's all that Urbit ever has been, and that's all that you know, we wanted from it. Um, but what this pitch doesn't give is you know, what, like this describes the characteristics of, of Martian code, but it doesn't describe what, what it would be, what you would do with it. Um, what does a rehabilitated software stack look like? Um, and that he didn't, you know, he didn't really talk about in 2010. I mean, there, there, there are some more details in the blog post, but um, that, that aspect of the pitch has evolved a lot. So now we go forward to 2013. Um, so September of this year, uh, the character of urban development changed forever because Curtis finally burned through his dot-com profits. And so he can't just keep working on this on his own. He has to make a decision, okay, what am I gonna do about Urbit? What am I gonna do about uh, you know, having a job or whatever? Um, and the other thing that's happened at this point is that there's a prototype of, of Arvo, of Urbit OS, that is you know, this entirely self-hosted living machine uh, that is an operating system and a language and a network. So this is real in a way that it really was not in 2010. He talks a lot about how Urbit is very much vaporware in 2010. By the time you get to 2013, you have a prototype that goes you know, uh, through the whole stack. You can even access it through a browser, although you can't do much with it that way. Um, and so at this point, it feels like this is actually something that... Um, that he, I mean, he, he'd been taking it seriously this, this whole time, but it's something that he could take to other people and be like, we should build this. So this spurs a few different things to happen. Um, he makes the urbit.org website. Uh, someone posts, posts that to Hacker News, uh, who is, of course, uh, Hacker News is always skeptical of, of everything, but especially Urbit. Uh, but some Hacker News readers are intrigued and end up becoming important figures in the Urbit community. Um, I saw it then while I was you know, boarding class browsing Hacker News, and it was uh, like it, it, it just it felt like a whole new world, right? It, it, something that that I could explore that felt like I was starting over with programming, which is uh, which was extremely attractive. Um, I didn't know what you would use it for. I didn't have any idea of a personal server or something like that. But it didn't matter. It was an interesting language. It was an interesting uh, world to explore. And the lore, the, just the way he described it in terms of Martian computing, that was really fascinating. Um, and there was also this video that he put out that uh, basically just showed him booting a couple of uh, submarines, which we now call comets, upgrading them to destroyers, which we now call planets, running little bits of Hoon, um, having them talk to each other. This is before chat, so they're just sending highs to each other with messages, um, and using the file system to run code off of the other ship. And, and there's no vo voiceover on this video. Um, it's just a screen grab, and all the uh, like narration happens just as a conversation, you know, simulated conversation between these two ships. Um, and the, the music is this Brian Eno music, which if you're familiar, is very like immersive, ethereal, and it communicates like this is an alien world. And so that was extremely compelling to me. Not as something that I'd be like, this is you know, obviously what the world needs forever or whatever, but I was like, eh, this is like, I wanna learn more about this, right? I wanna see what, you know, see if I can learn this alien programming language and just, I don't know, you know, hang out. First thing I did, of course, was submit a pull request to make a build on Slackware because it didn't build on Slackware, you know, classic Linux. But, um, yeah, at the same time, uh, Galen, who's now the CTO of Talon, sorry, CEO of Talon, 
um, saw the post. So this is when he first encountered Urban as well. Um, and he posted on Hacker News, you know, he, so here I am in a submarine learning a foreign language. What an afternoon. Urbit is uh, you know, arguably the long afternoon of civilization. Um, so that inspired Galen to go to the uh, personal cloud community gathering, which was the next day where Curtis presented a lightning talk. Unfortunately, the video disappeared from YouTube in about March, um, which is really sad. And if anyone has a copy of it or a way to get in touch with the organizers, let me know. Um, because it's, I think it's the only time Curtis has talked for like five minutes about a single thing and actually got through a ton of stuff. Um, it, it was actually a really good talk. Um, and I do have detailed notes on it and actually a transcript of its slides. So I'm actually going to go through um, and uh, look at, at, at some of those slides real quick to see how, what the pitch looks like now in 2013. So he opens uh, with a slide that says in big letters, the internet failed. Web apps in 2013 are the same as online services in 1993. We use our computers as modems to interact with special purpose online information appliances that we call web apps. Right, the, the goal of the internet was to be a network, not a modem. Therefore, the internet failed. This is a full stack failure. The whole stack is just hosed. We're trying to pretend it's good, and it's not. The server OS, the network, and the client OS, uh, which is the browser, are tightly linked together as, as one terrible system. Unix is a, is a 747. If you touch anything, you're liable to blow up the whole thing. He's, he, he said, I love Unix, it's dead, right? Um, in 1992, everybody's ports were open. The internet was a genuine social network. Then eternal uh, September happened. He said, hordes of orcs were unleashed and we're all trying to recover that state of innocence. Which is basically true, right? The internet gets used, uh, you know, it, it isn't people talking with people, it's people talking with platforms. So the response to failure is to recognize that the uh, 20th century stack is totaled and layer over it. You gotta have uh, absolute semantic isolation between the old and the new. Anything short of a clean slate rewrite will fail. We have to design a new stack for an alien planet, which is of course a reference to Martian code, although he doesn't bring up the metaphor explicitly. Urban is composed of Nock, Hoon, and Arvo. It's all in the public domain at the time. Nowadays it's MIT because public domain is sticky uh, legally. Um, but the important thing is that Ur Urbit you know, may have been a secret at one point, like he didn't try to publish it for a while, but it is never intended to be uh, proprietary. He then describes the network topology and distribution mechanism, uh, followed by a, a path to success, uh, which is that you know, first Urbit would be a fun toy for geeks, then it would be a platform as a service, he references Docker, which was just gaining traction at that time. Some of the people at that same conference were giving talks about Docker, like, hey, here's your personal cloud, finally. Um, and then Urbit would be your, your personal uh, cloud, and then eventually, he says far in the future, uh, would take over the browser as well. So today, we're a lot further along the line than we were in 2013. Um, the details have changed, but the um, story has played out remarkably similar to how it was planned. Um, even though that was, you know, nine years ago now. So as we come to the end of, of, of 2013, and based on, based on that pitch, Curtis uh, you know, raises money for, for Tlon. But at the time, it wasn't obvious that, uh, you know, a venture-funded startup was the correct way to build Urbit. Because remember, his goal at this point was still just to build Urbit. It wasn't, uh, I mean, it never really has been to try to you know, succeed as an entrepreneur or something like that. And so the ways you can build something like Urbit is you can build it as a, as a personal project of passion, which is what he did for a long time, right? This is a lot of advantages. It's as pure as your passion is. Uh, there's no principal agent problem. There's no alignment worries within the team. But the two big disadvantages are it requires some independent funding, and the big one is it restricts the pace of development because you can only have one person working on it. 
second option is uh, you could create a nonprofit organization. Um, some open source projects do this, and some of them are effective. Um, you could, in theory, create a, a clear mission for such an organization that closely aligns what you want to do with Urbit, um, you know, with what the organization, what, what, what their objective is. But the problem for developing Urbit at that stage is that nonprofits often don't have the drive to build something sort of as bold and new as Urbit. Um, they, they, they need sort of constant correction of what they're doing from, from, from the markets to, to make something like Urbit be actually practical, right? Because if you make some poor decision, you need something to correct you. And nonprofits often don't have sort of enough pressure in that direction. And so they end up uh, spiraling off and, and never getting anyth anything done. The goal of the organization often, uh, over, over enough time, becomes more to survive than to actually uh, you know, accomplish their goals. Doesn't always end up this way, but those, are, but, the, but those are risks of it. A third option is uh, you can build it as an academic project, which is pretty common for clean slate projects, because uh, you can have the mandate to think about outside the box and not be bothered by the market, which helps in, in some ways, but again, they almost always wander off into the wilderness because there isn't enough pressure to actually build practical software. Um, that ends up being, for, for a project like Urbit, the only thing, like the most important thing you need is, is to be grounded, and academic projects often are not. So the fourth option is as a startup. And, um, there's a lot of disadvantages to startups, right? You need significant seed funding, and you gotta have a plan to become profitable, you gotta think about it as a business. But also, this pressure is virtuous in the sense that it, it stops you from spiraling on, on useless tangents. It keeps you grounded. And ultimately, the, the biggest risk for something like Urbit, especially at that time, is that it never gets done. And so, a startup means that you're, you, know, you have a, a finite runway, and by the time you get to that end of that runway, you either need to be done or be able to convince someone else to give you more money. And um, that's, that's crucially important for a project like Urbit, especially at that, at that stage. So for the first 11 years, Urbit started as, as a personal passion, uh, passion project, right? It's just Curtis. And that was appropriate for the time because you couldn't really parallelize the work, right? It was very important that development proceed from a single mind and have a, a coherence to, through the whole thing, and that at any time you could throw away any section of it or all of it and rewrite it from scratch. Um, and when you're in that mode, you really, like, you really can't do that with more than one person generally. Um, any other input that comes in just contaminates and compromises the, the goal of being able to think about it all from scratch. But, that, 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 couldn't, that, that was never gonna be able to last forever because Urbit is trying to replace the entire internet stack, and so that's too big of a project for one person to do forever. So by the time we get to 2013, and he has a prototype of Arvo and so on, um, he decides that this is a good time to try to actually build out a team around it. And so he put together uh, essentially that, that pitch that I, that I just went through and gave that to investors and it was compelling to them, and they invested seed money to create the Talon Corporation. Now, the biggest risk of a company, of course, is that it becomes too profit-focused um, and has too short of a time horizon, potentially. So he mitigated this in two ways. Um, Talon owns a lot of address space. He, he, you know, since Curtis created it, he started with all the address space, of course, and so he granted a, a lot of it to Talon uh, so that Tlon would have a long time horizon, because if Tlon can make address space worth more, then Tlon makes money. Um, the other thing he did to avoid becoming too profit focused, hopefully, is that he, got, he earmarked some, of, some galaxies to become the treasury of just urbit.org, which was an idea for a uh, nonprofit foundation that would be created eventually to uh, work on Urbit development and just in general support Urbit from the perspective of a nonprofit because there are various advantages of that. 
And at, at some point, you want to have the resilience of having, you know, sort of many different forms of entities working on Urban. Um, and so he, he earmarked, you know, some galaxies for that. And just in the last uh, less than a year, the Urban Foundation was created and has received some of those galaxies. Uh, and you know, hopefully at some point we'll receive more. Um, Basically, yeah, there, you, know, you, you couldn't use a nonprofit to develop Urbit from where it was at then, but where we're at now in this more mature ecosystem, there's a lot to gain from, from having a nonprofit working on it. So, end of 2013, um, the Tlon Corporation has been established to work on Urbit. A uh, typical Urbit user now is uh, a hacker news reader. You know, much more likely than, than his uh, readers of his blogs. There's, there's still a few of those around, but honestly, at this point, most of, them, most of the people on Urbit come from Hacker News because they're actually techies, and at this point, Urbit is mostly interesting to techies. Um, the the like, entire social scene around Urbit is just Dawes Next chat room, right? So it's a single chat room of reasonable volume, would vary, you know, depending on, uh, you know, when anyone had last heard of us on the Earth Internet. Um, and that was it, right? Technical accomplishments are we had a, a prototype of Arvo, and the pitch is, as I said, the, you know, the Internet is hosed. We've got a layer over it. So now we come to 2014. And in a lot of ways, the focus of 2014 is building out the company, right? Um, a bunch of people cycle through in one way or another, joining the company, leaving, uh, and it takes until well, around October or so before we you know, finally resolve to a core team. Uh, there was a chaotic internship program that summer where we had more interns than employees for a while, um, and yeah, there was basically just in general a lot of chaos until you get to around October, and then we resolved to a core team of Curtis, Galen, myself, Anton Dudin, and Henry Alt. And that team of five took us for the next couple of years. Um, I, I actually came on that summer as an intern. Um, Anton Dudin did as well. And uh, we both dropped out to work on Urbit. I still didn't really know what Urbit was for. I didn't un you know, understand the idea of a personal server. But it seemed like a fascinating project and an interesting opportunity to just you know, try startup life. I could always go back to school, I figured. And since startups succeed or fail quickly, you know, I, not, not a lot to, to lose, right? Within a couple of years, I'll know whether Urbit has you know, succeeded. And if not, I'll go back to school, right? Um, ended up taking a lot longer than that. Uh, another thing we did is we, we unlaunched um, to avoid talking to the world and just build Urbit. This is what urbit.org look like um, for, you know, af after somewhere around fall of 2014, for almost a year it looked like this, where it's just, we're working on this, the network's still running, and people are still chatting in, in Dosnex's chat room, but um, we have essentially no Earthside, uh, like, talking with anyone, except every once in a while we end up on Hacker News. So this gave us the space to work on a lot of core stuff, right? Um, this is when we introduced Ford and Gaul for the first time, right? So we had a, an actual user space where you could run apps. Didn't have app distribution, that comes much later, but you, you could run apps in user space instead of the old BAT system of just, um, as just a hackish way of loading user code. Um, also introduced at this point U3, which is the current version of the runtime. Um, it has the modern road system, the modern allocator. A lot of the stuff that we've worked on uh, you know, ever since then was introduced at that point. Uh, yeah. So, um, typical urban users the same, social topography is the same, basically we're just working on stuff. And, and our pitch has changed from, this is something you, you should care about, to more like, you know what, we're not going to oversell this. Urbit is fun to play with for system geeks, and that's it. Um, 
at some point, yeah, herbage should be everything, but we don't put that forward as a pitch to anyone. 2015, we keep doing this stuff, right? We, we're, we're still unlaunched uh, for a while in 2015. We continue working on develop, uh, core development work. Uh, at the, right at the very beginning of, of the year, Curtis assigns me a, a project. He's like, it should take two or three weeks. You're going to rewrite Clay to have uh, typed files and stuff. Um, and it ended up taking about three months, which felt like forever at the time. Because remember, I'm still on like a two-year time scale. And I'm like, I just spent three months rewriting Clay. That feels like forever. It's way longer than I planned. Um, but it's actually not that long for a project of that sort. Like, I actually feel, like now I feel really good about like how that worked and how fast it happened. Um, because I've learned the lesson that basically we can do anything that we need to do in Urbit. Um, but it'll take longer than, than we planned back then. Um, and uh, that lesson took a long time to learn of just continually being like, yeah, this is going to take two weeks. This is going to take three weeks. And it would take a lot longer. But that's, uh, that's software development. Yeah, so we uh, rewrote Clay. Anton rewrote Air. Um, we wrote Bane, uh, the timer Bane for the first time. Rewrote Chat a couple of times. We wrote the terminal. Just iterated on a lot of the core stuff in Urbit. Um, the other thing that we really focused on was being able to serve websites from your ship, which now Terrell has made it so you can do that again with Studio. But for a long, but there was a gap there for a while where you couldn't do this. But back in 2015, we were like, "What do you do with the server? You serve websites." So we managed to get Urbit.org hosted on a ship. It was slow. It was especially slow if you tried to like use the docs or something because we had a cache system where if you're the first person in the last like hour to go somewhere, it's going to be really slow. It's going to be like 15 seconds before the page to load, and then after that, it's fast. Um, but uh, it worked um, in the sense that you know Urbit.org worked, and uh, we could take like a Hacker News hit because you know you're, you're using external caches, nginx caches. Um, and so that was, you know, that was what we put a lot of effort into, and that put pressure on a bunch of different parts of the system, which was good, and and you know, let us improve a lot of different areas, even if we ended up moving away from that as a, a like product direction, at least for a while. So, you know, typical urban user social scene kind of basically looked the same, right? Um, the pitch is the same. It's we, we've made more technical accomplishments, but we're still in this, you know, half research, half just prototyping mode, um, and uh, and that takes us to the end of 2015. And we get to 2016, which is where a lot of stuff happens, um, and it's triggered by the most mundane of reasons, which is Thawn starts to run out of runway, right? We start to run out of money. Um, it's, of course, frustrating to have to switch into like fundraising mode and ha having to pitch Urbit again and thinking about short-term priorities. But it ended up being actually hugely beneficial, which you know, is evidence that the decision to make Urbit be developed by a startup uh, was a good idea, at least for the time. So uh, one of the first things that happened in 2016 is we published a 57-page white paper um, which is really long and really dense. Um, and Anton, Ray, and I are listed as co-authors, but it's basically Curtis wrote it. Um, we gave some feedback, but Curtis is not known for responding to feedback. <laughs> um, but, it, but it ends up being, well, not easy to read. Um, it, it is still the most comprehensive descript like technical description of Urbit, probably, that, that exists. Um, and mostly, it's still true. Uh, actually, some parts of it are more true now than they were before, and we haven't really rewritten, or we, we haven't written a new version of this. I would love to do that someday, but uh, it's a lot. Another thing that happened in 2016 is we discovered a bug in the uh, Pat P scrambler, which made it so that uh, cousin names really common, right? So my name back then was Wicktuck Falrex, and on the network, even though there was only a few hundred of us, there was a Wick Dev Falrex. Um, and so that, that pattern was really common, um, which meant that it wasn't doing a good job of scrambling. 
And uh, we ended up deciding to take the nuclear option and just rename everybody, which was really traumatic um, because you get really attached, attached to your name. And uh, that was really depressing. But <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, I, we can't do that ever again, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that happens. That takes a lot of effort to, uh, like to execute. Um, another thing that happens in 2016 is uh, there's a whole controversy around Lambda Comp and, and Strange Loop. So Curtis applied to speak to a few functional programming conferences because back then we weren't thought of as a crypto project at all. We were thought of as a functional programming project, basically. A little bit of a systems project, but um, functional programmers seemed to be the ones that were most interested. And so we, uh, well, Curtis applied to speak at, at, at some of these about Urbit and uh, ended up getting invited to speak at Strange Loop and then a little later at LambdaConf. Uh, both times when, uh, when they announced the, speaker, the list of speakers for the conference, uh, activists on Twitter objected to Curtis's presence because of his political writings uh, from years before. The details don't matter a lot, but there was, you know, it was a whole thing at the time, uh, and Strange Loop rescinded their offer. Uh, but the Lambda Comp organizer, uh, John DeGoes, if anyone knows him, he's big in the Scala community, um, wrote a thoughtful blog post where he argued basically that conferences shouldn't endorse the beliefs of, it, of their speakers. They shouldn't be vetting the speakers based on their, on their beliefs. And so since he didn't believe that Curtis would behave badly at the conference, he couldn't in good conscience rescind the offer. Uh, a lot of people you know, obviously didn't like this. A bunch of speakers pulled out. Uh, all of their sponsors pulled out for a little while. Some of them came back. Um, but ultimately, the conference actually ended up getting new speakers, new, new sponsors, uh, and went off well, had record attendance, and it all ended up working out for them. And, and Curtis spoke and, you know, without incident. Um, and so I bring this up for you know, a couple of reasons. Obviously, it, it, it took a lot of mind space at the time because we were worried about what this meant for Urbit as a project. Right, if like if the association with Curtis was always a big question mark of how that would affect Urbit as a uh, sorry Urbit as a project, and being like canceled back then was a very different, it's a different animal than it is now. Um, the a lot fewer people had been canceled, and we didn't have like the cultural antibodies against it. There was nowhere to go after cancellation exactly, or at least that's what it felt like. Um, Whereas now, there's, there's whole communities that are effectively immune from cancellation. Uh, some of them have already been canceled. Some of them just go there anyways without being canceled because they like the vibes or something. Um, and so that's very different now than it was back then. And one of the things that we learned you know, in, in 2016 was actually, this is fine. The, the impact on Urbit was actually pretty small, even in you know, a very chaotic situation. And in fact, the biggest impact ultimately ended up being that we brought in several productive members of the Urbit community that heard about Urbit or, uh, during this time. Um, you know, because their leaders in the functional programming community would be condemning Curtis, and so they'd be like, what is this guy working on? And then, you know, they fall into Urbit. Um, the other thing it did was it made us really be precise about and, and just kind of make clear what neutrality means for a project like Urbit and for a company like Tlon. Because even at that point, um, most Tlon employees and most people in the Urbit community were not in broad agreement with Curtis's politics, and, and that's true even now. Um, but he never made it an issue for anyone at the company or anyone on the network because the point of Urbit is to be neutral infrastructure where each community can own their own gathering places and enforce their own norms. Urbit is, is not supposed to be a political cudgel. It's, it's, it's supposed to be neutral. So for example, Klon's policy is essentially, we don't participate in retail politics as a company. We don't endorse, you know, as an employee, we don't endorse your politics or your extracurricular activity. And so because of that, we don't care what they are one way or the other. We do care about your conduct in the workplace. And if you behave badly there, we're going to respond appropriately. 
And so is, is this a perfect system? Maybe not, but uh, it's worked quite well. And events like LambdaConf have uh, let us be able to sort of credibly hold that, that neutral position because we can say, look, we did it all the way back then in this case, then in this case, then in this case. Um, and that I, I think is really important for, for a project like Urbit that is trying to be, you know, on some level, everything to everyone. So all this is happening against the backdrop of Tlon nearly running out of money. And so we spent the last couple months of a runway um, putting together materials for a crowd sale. Uh, we actually got within like, I don't know, two or three months of running out of, of money. Um, and so this is, the, the, the pitch here looks somewhat different, right? There, um, it's the first time that we primarily described Urbit as a personal server instead of just as a full stack rewrite. So we're starting to describe a little bit of what this rehabilitated internet looks like. Um, it's still an extension of the argument that you know, the internet is hosed, full stack replacement is, is required. Um, but yeah, you, you, know, you need to start to, to give a little more of a description of what's gonna happen in the future. Eventually, uh, of course the plan was for everything to be on Urbit, but in the meantime, our idea at the time was we'll build API connectors to control Earth services from a single place. Get all your data into the same place, uh, control, you know, post Twitter from your Urbit, post to Facebook from your Urbit, get your email from your Urbit. Um, and so we started building API connectors for that kind of thing, which was again a good pressure on the, uh, on the underlying system because it made us be like, oh, okay, actually the HTTP client needs to be really solid. Actually, you know, all, all these different things need to actually work, but this never panned out as a project, sorry, as, as a product. Um, and in, in part, it, it felt like we weren't capable of building products, which was basically that Urbit wasn't capable of, of hosting a real product at that point for basically technical reasons. It just, there was too many things that still needed to be done. But it's always important to be trying to build a product because that's what, um, that's what makes it clear what needs to be done to, to let you build a product. Um, well, what was encouraging about the crowd sale actually, um, well, one of the encouraging things was that it went really smooth on a technical level, uh, which we, we didn't build it on Urbit, we built it with like Node and SQL and you know, Stripe API and so on. Um, and that one went really smooth and it seemed to be really clear to users how to use it and so on, which meant that we as a company were capable of building products, it seemed, and it was actually the Urbit stack that was not there yet. So, we offered uh, 1,020 stars, which is four galaxies worth, at $256 per star, which we hope to sell within a month, uh, which would allow us to work on Urbit for about six months and then raise more money. People talked about Urbit, but it was unclear whether anyone really cared about Urbit because nobody had ever given money for Urbit. And so we were worried, and we're also worried because we only had like two months of runway. But we lined up a coin days uh, a Coindesk article for the beginning of this month-long crowd sale, and we're ready to go. And then the afternoon before, we just on a whim basically e emailed our, our mailing list with a link to like pre-sale with 20% discount, right? So $205 per star. Um, and it ended up that within a, a few hours, so before any other marketing or anything else, any you know anything published on the uh, open internet, we sold out the entire batch. Uh, it was within, my recollection, recollection is four hours, Galen thinks it was two hours, but it's something like that, just a couple hours, right? Um, which was a wild success for us, right? We, like that was very, we always knew it was a possibility, but I, I definitely did not expect that to happen. Um, it meant we didn't have to shut down, shut down the company, and it meant that people cared about Urbit. Uh, it also brought a lot more attention. All, all of these things that happened in 2016 brought a lot more attention to Urbit. And many of the, the people that we currently think of as, as sort of elders of the Urbit project got seriously involved at this time, even if they'd seen it sometime before. Master Morzad, Palafan Fazlop, uh, Rob Nesrick for, I mean, I, honestly, a, a bunch more, you know, essentially showed up in 2016 or got really involved in 2016. And 
that ended up being, you know, obviously having a huge impact on the direction of urban development. Um, in the midst of this, kind of just a month or two after the crowd sale, uh, I actually ended up leaving Tuan uh, and didn't work on Urbit for the next two years. Basically because Urbit, I realized Urbit was a much larger and longer project than I'd planned on. Um, I had never committed to Urbit as a life project. I was still on some level just suspending disbelief about it, right? All these arguments about how Earth software works and stuff. I mean, I, you know, I had been programming since I was young, but this is the only place I'd ever worked. I you know, dropped out of college to work on it. And so I was like, I, I don't know. It feels like this is gonna be a really long project. It's just not in, in, in my uh, time frame. And so I, I left at that point because I felt like, okay, they have money, they have, like, it's, it's sort of a high point, which is a good time to leave. They can replace me. Um, and so I left. I went traveling for a few months, went back to school for one more semester, joined a crypto startup called Numerai for about a year and a half uh, before finally returning to Urbit. Um, so during that time, most of what I know is secondhand. But um, around the end of 2016, a community, I, I've heard stories of a, a community that formed at, on Urbit at a chat channel hosted by uh, Bar Pub Tarver, um, who's still around the community. But um, this was notable as being the first time the community was hosted on Urbit by someone not at Tlon, right? And not on Dosnek. It's you know you actually have another another chat channel, which seems very small now, but back then it was very notable. Um, other thing that happened in 2016 is Galen ended, ends up becoming CEO at this point. So when he when he first joined, he joined basically as a designer and front end developer, and then very quickly became uh, you know was declared VP of product, which uh, you know in a team of five titles don't matter a lot, but um, for you know for a while he needed to get to know Curtis. He he needed to get into the, into the, like he, he and Curtis needed to get into the same um, into the same mindset about about urban development. And so by the time we get to 2016, we're basically there. And so now Galen is CEO. Curtis becomes CTO, and um, it's become clear that you know that Galen has has chosen this to be his life project, basically. Um, and so you know he ends up being CEO from then, and he's done a, a great job at it. All right, so come to end of, of 2016, typical Urbit user comes from now several different sources. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people from functional programming community, from the uh, privacy type community, um, and uh, yeah, we basically covered everything here. The um, so t 2017 again, I wasn't there, so I don't have a lot of details. But there was another crowd sale which also sell sold out within a few hours. Um, the people that showed up in 2016 congealed into a coherent community. Tlon hired several of them, and Tlon kind of moves into another into another era at this point. Um, I know chat was rewritten into hall and talk, which a lot of people remember, remember fondly. It was sort of the best command line version of chat. Udon is also from this time. And then in 2018, Tlon raises a lot more money, hires maybe 20 employees. Not like, uh, it's a lot more money from Tlon's perspective, not from the perspective of like a crypto project. But, um, but we hired about 20 employees. And this was a very dramatic shift. When you're going from, you know, five people for a long time, by the time you get to here, they had maybe six or seven, and then you go to 20 employees, that's huge. Um, and it takes a while to cohere as a team. Near the end of the year, I rejoined the team um, because basically after, after my like rumspringa, basically, I, I realized that, uh, that Urban is in fact the answer, the right answer to a lot of technical problems, and it's very important for being so. Right? It's clearly the most important thing that I can work on. And now that we have a larger team, success seems like actually possible on, not on a two year time scale, but on some kind of time scale. So uh, right at the end of 2018, we also transfer the ledger for Urbit ID from internal documents to the Ethereum blockchain. So this was a huge project because we had to gather keys. We, we, we had to teach uh, you know, a thousand plus 
people who own planets to how to generate keys and send us the public keys and to teach them about Ethereum and then deploy all this, you know, sending many thousands of transactions, something like 100,000 transactions to the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it's a good thing they were cheap back then. Um, and it, like, this was an incredibly important step because you can't take Urbit ID seriously if who owns what is just in a ships.txt on our, you know, on one of our laptops, basically, right? Well, not laptop, but um, if it's just in company documents, right? You don't own your ship. And so this makes the network real in a way that it really, really did not before that. Um, uh, that's kind of a recurring theme. There's lots of things. It's like, when we do this, now Urbit is real in a way that it wasn't before. And, you know, that continues to the present. We also started to be seen as, as more of a crypto project at this point, um, which is you know both true and false, right? But right. Um, so typical Urban user at this point, there's now a, a, a lot of them. Like there's a lot more of a focus on decentralization, on privacy, um, a lot more overlap with the kind of people that are interested in cryptocurrencies. Um, which is a bit of a difference. The biggest difference on some level is that we're no longer like dependent on hacker news to get people interested in Urbit. There's uh, you know, a whole other world of people interested in Urbit. Social scene, though, is still basically one channel on uh, Dosnek, which actually by this point, you know, the great renaming got renamed to Marzad. Um, yeah, we, we, we had some really nice technical accomplishments during 2018 as well. The, Knock by code compiler that we use now was written during this time. Um, Ford Turbo dates to this time. Um, the the pitch is is the same as before. It's still personal server, digital sovereignty, and so on. The biggest difference is that between you know 2015, 2016 to 2018, it gets much easier to make this pitch because. The idea of a personal server goes from being just some weird thing Hillary Clinton had for emails to being something that's obviously useful for anyone. Um, people became a lot less naive about what the internet looks like. And we didn't have to start by explaining that big companies are neither neutral nor benevolent. So you can just start you know, three quarters of the way through the pitch, which helps a lot. All right. So 2019, very beginning of 2019, Curtis leaves Tlon, leaves Urbit. Um, this is like his, his own decision, and it's, again, during a high point of Urbit's development, right? There's, there's not any like, active controversies. We have a nice long runway. Um, and Curtis had, for a long time, told us that he was planning to quit at some point, um, that that was his, his goal, was to work until he was able to quit Urbit, because um, he's not a good leader for a project with a lot of contributors. He, he knew this. Um, it doesn't comport with his personality, basically. Um, and so he wanted to leave as soon as he felt able to. And in January 2019, he felt able to uh, because the team had actually you know, congealed to, to that point and Kurt Galen had developed enough that you could get to the point where he was like, yeah, actually, I can leave and Urbit will be even more likely to, to succeed than if he stayed is what was, it was his, his evaluation, which you know, requires a, a lot of uh, humility and um, a really long like, perspective of the world to do that after having worked on the project for whatever it was, 17 years by that point. Um, and he left very thoroughly, right? He stopped contributing code. Um, he hasn't spoken publicly about Urbit since then at all. Uh, there was a short transitional period where the engineering team talked with him about some stuff, but then essentially nothing. Right? Um, and part of that's because Curtis has strong views about all the technical stuff, and you can't reduce that somewhat without eliminating it entirely. And he knew that, we knew that, and so it, that's what happened. Um, this left, of course, a vacuum of technical leadership because we had no other hierarchy within the engineering team. And so for a while, we basically just came to consensus on anything that we wanted to do, which worked surprisingly well. We'd all worked closely with Curtis, and so we'd absorbed his attitude, his, his boldness toward uh, systems programming, and so we could pretty much come to agreement most of the time. 
we knew that that, that arrangement within the company was never going to work forever. Um, and especially once COVID shows up and the company becomes fully remote, it becomes harder to just gather around the kitchen table and come to consensus on, on something. And so we decide we need some kind of structure there. So I become the technical lead of the infrastructure team at that point in May of 2020. And then a year later, in May of 2021, I become CTO and have led uh, core development since then. Um, on the technical side, uh, the pace of kernel like accomplishment has accelerated, right? I, um, we released new jail, which means more reliable uh, interaction with, with Ethereum, and it allowed personal breaches for the first time, which is huge because it used to mean that uh, anytime you had a continuity error, you had to wait until the whole network breached, which was a problem because we were starting to breach the network fewer times. Um, and so, yeah, um, you can't do anything real in Urbit if you're constantly losing data. We also released new aims, which made the network more reliable. Static all, which uh, made a huge difference in terms of being able to build user space apps, uh, making them understandable. We released threads, which are also related to all that. Um, we released Modulo, which was the first kind of truly usable web app, um, where you'd actually keep this tab open and, and uh, you know, see your chat channels and notebooks inside Modulo, which is, which is a huge deal because it's like actually kind of a product for the first time that kind of works. It, you know, there's a bar of usability that we passed that makes a huge difference. And in part because of that, you have separate communities beginning to form. Um, the, the diaspora of BarPub becomes NoPub, hosted by somebody else. Ninja Folden, Winter Patches, some others create these notebooks early on. Communities start to form around that. That splintering was really profound when for so long it had been one chat channel, and that's the urban community. So 2019. We basically went, went through all this stuff. I'm, I'm going to give less detail as we come to the, most, the more recent times, because a lot of you know it already. The pace of development accelerated, I, and I, I can't go through kind of each point anymore, um, because so much starts happening. Um, 2020, we introduced the idea of groups as an organizing principle for, for landscape. We released Ford Fusion, making reliable OTA updates. Klon goes to goes to remote work, as I mentioned, which makes Urbit feel less like an SF, like a San Francisco phenomenon. Uh, we, we stopped doing the meetups in San Francisco, which were kind of a center of Urbit culture in some level. Um, but this was also really good for Urbit development in a lot of ways because uh, other areas became hotbeds of Urbit development, which you know, ultimately, for a project like Urbit, has to be the case. Uh, one of the biggest things that happens in 2020 is at the end of the year, we have what we, what we believe to be the final uh, network-wide continuity breach. Uh, basically because by this point, we have all these groups and communities and we can't just be deleting everyone's data all the time. And so we've finally gotten to the point where we've fixed enough AIMS bugs, memory leaks, we have reliable OTAs, we can do personal breaches, and so we just stopped doing network breaches, which is a huge deal and makes Urbit real, as I say. Um, this sort of exits play mode in a, in a sense, right? It's no longer a test net, really. Um, the typical ur urban user is getting much more varied. Social scene is broadening a lot. Our pitch is still pretty similar to, to before. 2021, last year, three big things happened. We released third-party software distribution, so anyone can release an app, and anyone can more or less safely install it. This is the accumulation of a long effort. We've been trying to do this for many years, and it makes Urbit real in a powerful way, right? Since 2016, at least, and really before that, there were a bunch of little apps and demos that people had made. Um, there was a Tiny Mud clone in 2016, a Trello clone, uh, TalkBot, Block.io integration, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but you couldn't run it unless you were an expert to know how to install it, and it's still gonna be brittle. If any update comes through, it's gonna be a problem, and also, you know, Breaches are going to come through, delete all your data anyways. So that was never really you know, something that, that made sense to do. And now, on some level, it does. And all of a sudden, you have 
um, a few dozen ap applications appearing on the network, and Urbit is not just a chat app anymore, but an entire platform that you can build apps for. Prototype level, on, on some level, the app distribution, but it's there. And this ends up becoming a really important part of the pitch of Urbit, that it lets you do app development without doing DevOps. Um, you can write, when you're writing an app, you're writing code, and then you release the code, and that's it. You don't have to build a company around it, you don't have to build, you don't have to spin up servers, you don't have to, it's just you write code, and there's your app, um, which is, like, even now, we don't bring that up enough in, in, in our pitches, I, I don't think, but it, like, we're moving in that direction of just saying, yeah, this is what you use Urban for, um, if you're a developer. Second big thing happens in 2021 is assembly, right? Um, 300 or more people show up in Austin for the first public Urbit conference. And to me, it, it feels like a reunion show, right? It's all these people from, some of them from 2010, from 2013, from 2016, from all these different eras of Urbit, it, and, and people who you had just learned about Urbit just that year, all showing up at the same time, all excited about the same thing. And this made it really tangible to a lot of people, uh, even people who knew it, you know, cerebrally, that Urbit is real and it's a big deal and there's a lot of really interesting and uh, competent people that are obsessed with it. And so it was kind of a, a magical event for that reason. Third thing you have to 2021 is a lot of companies uh, start to work on products on, on top of Urbit. Uh, most of them are founded for this purpose. Some of them raise money, some of them you know, come from however they, they end up there. Um, probably shouldn't have even written this much of a list because I, looking at it now, I, I, I know that I've, I've omitted several, but like, yeah, you have people building apps, people building blockchain stuff, people building DAO tooling. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that companies start to work on. Um, which means that like, Klon and Urbit are no longer synonyms uh, in a really obvious way, which we'd known for a long time they weren't, but uh, that ends, like, that's, that's a huge deal and a, it, like, a strong like, mindset shift. By this point, typical Urbit user, you just can't even describe really um, because there's so many different archetypes and the, the social scene is now at the point where you have people show up on Urbit and it, depending on how you show up and which groups you end up in, you may not, never come into contact each, with each other, which was never the case before. Um, it, it used to be just that like, there was just, you know, there was urban community and then there was subsets of them. And now it's, you know, a, a lot of people don't even spend, you know, like keep up with, with urban community, the group, and are just in their own groups and never talk to each other, which is uh, just another milestone, right? Uh, the, the, the pitch has evolved somewhat to be you know, a place on the internet to call your own and a dramatically better developer experience for decentralized apps, as I mentioned. So that brings us to this year, um, where all of this accelerates. Um, Urban Foundation splits off from Tlon, begins to do its own thing. Uh, it extends a grant program that had begun years prior. Um, and you know, they're, they're putting on assembly this year. They're, most of you have interacted with the Urban Foundation in one way or another. Uh, we release our, our L2 solution to let users get planets without paying exorbitant transaction fees for on Ethereum. And you start getting these, these early versions of apps from uh, you know, non tlon companies working on Urban. Bunch more stuff you know, is intended to happen before the end of the year. We're, we're trying to get a bunch of technical stuff done before assembly, we'll see. Um, but yeah, and so that brings us to the present. And uh, I'm not gonna try and you know, uh, say anything about where we're going really right now because that's not the point of this talk. But it is really surreal to see where Urbit is now. And uh, when I think back at what it felt like in 2015, it's, it was just a whole different world, right? It was, it was isolating back then. There, it, there wasn't a feeling of Urbit is a thing that if I participate in it, there will be other people around me. It was like, there's five people here and we're gonna work on Urbit. And it's incredible to see that change. Um, the goal is, is, you know, is still to build the best software stack in the world, and we're a lot closer to that. And we need to have the best products, 
and we'd have hosting be easy and cheap, but basically you'd be able to get on Urbit easily, cheaply. You can see aspects of this in, in all the pitches until now. None of the pitches really contradict each other. They really just develop the pitch to say more about the future and, and, and less about how we got here. Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, I've skipped a lot because this ended up being, I think, more like an hour, but um, uh, that's a reasonably complete description of how Urbit was developed. And uh, yeah, I hope it gives like, a sense of, what, of, of where we're coming from and, and where we're going. Um, yeah, so I, I can take questions if we have time for that, but yeah. Um, so Tlon is like 35 maybe. Um, these other companies between them are probably another as many. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, two, two answers come to mind immediately. The, the way that, so from, from like a product perspective, I really thought that uh, using a personal server for hosting your website and host, like, and storing your files like Dropbox style, I was like, that's the obvious things you're ever gonna wanna do with this. That'll be the first thing we build. And, it's turned out that what has actually gained traction and what has actually been more interesting to people is basically chat and other kinds of, of communication, more like social media. Back, back then, I mean, even now to some extent, when you hear, you hear someone's starting a social media company, you're just like, well, okay, sure, everybody's doing this, especially back then, and like, what makes you different? And so we didn't think of ourselves that way, but to some extent, that ended up being the niche that has, that has served us, uh, which is surprising. Um, and then on a, on a very technical level, I, there, there's this idea of um, just kind of asynchronous programming that we leaned into a lot in the beginning that uh, Curtis thought was, was very sort of tractable. And in the last like three years or so, we've stepped away from a lot of that and tried to make everything as synchronous as possible for anyone who knows what that means. Um, and that's surprising because Curtis was really convinced that this could work and everything's gotten so much easier now that we've stepped away from that. Um, so that was one of those things that showed us, like, oh, okay, what, what we should be learning from Curtis is his way of developing things and his way of changing his minds about things, not necessarily whatever was the last thing that he, you know, that he believed was correct. Yeah, I mean, the, on, on some level, the, the milestone that, that, I, that I think of as almost the next milestone is getting Urbit to the point where it's a, uh, a barely viable stack for a moderately successful product, right? It's, it's very close to this, but there's a few things that make it not suitable for it. Um, and we're working on essentially all of those. Uh, I have a list somewhere of like four or five that I'm like, if we can do these, then we'll be at that barely viable level. And the way I think about it is, because Urbit has so many advantages, like the reason why people really enjoy developing for Urbit now, and there's so much you can do now, that once we get to, you know, to like check off all these boxes to get to the point where we're barely viable, the distance between that and being the best software stack in the world is actually really small. As soon as it works on some level, we're gonna zoom right past all that. And so, it's kind of a vague answer, but it also feels like it's not that far away. It's on the like 12 to 18 month time horizon, I feel like. Yeah. You have a question, Brian? Can you give us some more color on what the term an operating function means? Yeah, so the, um, the original post on Hacker News described, or, or, like the, the title was something like Urbit, an operating function or something like that. Um, and 
it's the idea that, you know, that Urbit is an operating system in the sense, what we call now an overlay OS, uh, meaning that it's a, it's a programming environment that, ha, you know, that you can't get outside of, right? We treat Unix the way that Unix treats like the BIOS or something. Um, but it's also, it, it is purely functional. And so everything that it's doing is just a function of input, and that input is data. And so that term suggests things like, okay, operating system, functional programming, but also just that everything you're doing is functional. Everything you're doing is deterministic. Everything you're doing is well specified uh, and completely specified um, and has been kind of really considered very carefully in a way that Unix has been more um, uh, crafted by just when something goes wrong, you whack it back in until you have something that basically works. But it's, that, that's a very like empirical approach to building things, and, and you have to have some amount of that to to, uh, you know, to build anything practical. But Urbit's goal is very much to reduce that down to a clean spec, and so, so the term operating function suggests that you're heading in that direction. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there will be pressure. There was a lot of pressure. Um, on some level, it feels like there's less pressure now than there was before. Um, and there will be, uh, there will certainly be many you know, communities that operate on Urbit who have um, policies around free speech that, uh, that I may not agree with, you may not agree with, many people may not agree with. Um, and basically, it's a, like, I don't think it's hopeless to be able to say, like, here's your space where you can do that, and you can, but there, um, but it isn't very profitable to try to, to pressure, you know, Tlon or the Urbit project as a whole, because they're, um, Basically, it's really hard, even just on a technical level, for Urbit to do much about that, right? You, you can't, like, even if you put in the code uh, some way for some central, you know, sensors to, to delete some speech or whatever, everyone's running their own code and they can just delete that from the code, right? And so because it's um, relatively inefficient to enforce sort of global censorship through something like Urbit, I think it's less likely to happen less likely to be severe in, in general. Um, but in general, I mean, you know, Urbit exists in the world. The world is complicated, and you, you, know, you try to navigate the, it the best you can. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's notable that the, that Efforts to police speech happen on Twitter and Facebook, and they don't happen on Microsoft Windows. Um, because how would you do it on Microsoft Windows, right? I mean, terrorists use Microsoft Windows, and nobody tries to you know, convince Microsoft that they need to fix this somehow. I mean, Microsoft doesn't sell directly to terrorists, but, well, when they know. But like, that's, that's all they can do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Kelvin versioning is is this idea of instead of having version numbers that go up off to infinity, you know, the, the basic difference between numbers that go up is they can go up as far as they want. Numbers that go that go down can only go down to zero because negative numbers aren't real. Um, and so the idea of Kelvin versioning is 
to say, okay, we're at version, so for example, hoon.hoon, which is the, the lowest layer of, of uh, the Arvo stack, is at Kelvin version 139, if I remember right. Um, and so that means that we're, we're committing to saying there's not gonna be more than 139 or 138 more versions, 139, I guess, more, more versions of this area of the code, um, which says basically we actually think that this code is the kind of code that can be done, um, that the pace of development slows down until you're like, okay, it's done. Anything else needs to happen needs to happen at a different level. And so that kind of suggests the answer to what should be Kelvin version and what shouldn't, because not everything should. Um, stuff that is high enough in the stack especially anything that is interacting with people, generally shouldn't be Kelvin versioned because what people want changes over time. Um, and that's not likely to ever, you know, come, like uh, reach a, a, a point of stasis. Also things very low in the stack often shouldn't be Kelvin versioned because uh, things interacting with the hardware, well, hardware gets better, hardware changes, different kinds of hardware shows up. And that's likely to happen for, you know, for as long as computers exist. And so that can't really be Kelvin versioned. Um, one way to describe the thesis of Urbit is that there is a stack in the middle that can be Kelvin versioned that says, okay, here's an environment for everything above to build in a really nice world and an environment for everything below that uh, just needs to support running Urbit, basically. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. And that's um, on, on the, the earlier question of, you know, what does Urbit need to become sort of barely viable? Um, security is, is probably the one that's gonna lag the latest. Um, that's the one that's, uh, that we've on some level put the least work into. We, we put a lot of work into making sure that Urbit is sort of securable, that the design is, is gonna be relatively easy to, to secure but we haven't put that much work into. We're kind of just starting to actually do the work of you know, looking at the runtime and being like, okay, this needs to be in a sandbox. This needs to be you know, not written in C or something like that. Um, and so that process is just beginning now. And, we, like, and that's not a fast process, right? I, that's gonna take minimum a year, probably more. Um, and at some point in that, you, you do want external auditors coming in and saying, okay, this, this makes sense, I feel good about this, this does not. At some point you want uh, penetration testers, all, all that kind of thing. It doesn't make sense to do right now because there's a lot of things that we know need to be done. A lot of areas that we know we need to look at and say, uh, okay, that's, you know, th this area needs to be rewritten until we can actually you know, feel like it makes sense to even audit this thing. Um, so where that's at is, is fairly early, which means don't keep important stuff on your orbit. It is very likely to be uh, hackable. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I can say it, it definitely is, even if I don't know exactly how to do it right now. But um, hopefully that will change within the next you know, year or two. At, at the moment, it is yours, but it is also, you own it, but someone else might pwn it, basically. <laughs> Basically, yeah, yeah, there's, um, when you think of, you know, Urbit taking over everything, that affects everything, right? It's the, you know, uh, there's this idea of at some point, Knox should be the only legal form of computing, right? And once you get there, then, uh, then a lot of things look very different. 
and so um, one area for that is, is is hardware. There's a bunch of different things you could do, uh, both in you know just trying to run knock fast. There there are some options. There's you know some tweaking you could do, but also routers that are aware of Urbit ID that are aware of things that they're able to cache. That kind of thing could be very powerful. Um, there, uh, you know, Urbit in different form factors is. Is, is a useful thing to do. And basically, we as Klon are not able to, to devote resources to this right now. Um, we really want to get Urbit to the point of, of being you know, a, a fairly viable stack, right? Um, and so we, we don't pitch that, that future all that much. Um, I hope that at some point we, we are able to. And, and I also think that it would be good if we could sort of, I don't know what the term is, like segment our, our, our pitch somewhat because like to, to someone like me, that the pitch from 2010, from 2013, is actually much more compelling than the pitch that we usually use now, just because I'm a systems programmer, and that is inspiring to me. And the, you know, the pitch that we have now is, I care about it, but, it, but, it, but it's not something, but I care about it more cerebrally, right? Um, and that's not because Urbit has changed that much, so much as that it's possible to make that pitch now, and we're talking potentially to somewhat different people. And so what I, one thing that I've wanted to do for a long time is be able to make that old, you know, 2010, 2013 pitch for now for engineers and be like, okay, when I'm talking to engineers, I can pitch it this way. Talking to, uh, to people who, who view it as a product, talk about it another way. And it'd be nice if you could have someone, you know, a, a pitch that's angled towards hardware developers and be like, okay, this is what you can do with hardware. Um, a pitch that, at, you know, at, at some point, the, I, I feel like in the same category is we're going to want to replace the browser. We're going to want to have our own graphics system, right? And there are people that are going to be interested in that. And if you start talking to them about uh, decentralization or whatever, they're like, eh, whatever. I'm actually much more interested in a whole new world where I can have a new graphics system built from scratch. And that's a pitch that we don't ever talk about, right? So hopefully at some point we get to there. Thanks. Um, good job. And <laughs>